We're broadcasting today from the Ocean Science Center at the Aquarium of the Pacific in Long Beach, California. As you watch this presentation, we welcome your questions. You can send them to us via Twitter using at Aquarium Pacific and the hashtag AOP Sink or Swim. Or you can send us an email to live at lbaop.org. The Aquarium of the Pacific regularly brings the visual and the performing arts together with science to create emotional connections between people and the ocean and marine life. And we're proud to have collaborated with the Annenberg Space Phot Photog Photography to bring a new exhibition of photographs to the aquarium focusing on human responses to sea level rise around the world. This exhibition, Sink or Swim, Designing for a Sea Change, is now on view in the aquarium's Great Hall. And every visitor who comes to the aquarium with general admission will be, have the opportunity to see this remarkable exhibition. To complement the exhibition, the aquarium is highlighting sea level rise programming, including our daily Science on a Sphere show on the sphere behind me. We have a, a show called Rising Sea. We will also have a mini series of lectures with sea level rise experts this summer. Global climate change is resulting in rising seas, coastal flooding, and increasingly powerful storm surges, requiring people living on coastlines around the world to adapt. Responses can include complex, futuristic infrastructure projects to divert the water, modern housing projects that float or otherwise accommodate higher stands of sea level, and low-tech, low-cost buildings made with locally available materials that best serve the community and the culture of the residents. And another option, of course, is strategic retreat. The key is to capitalize on human creativity, innovation, and on scientific knowledge to make coastal communities less vulnerable to sea level rise and to coastal storms. And to give us a framework for understanding sea level rise and predictions for the future, I would like to introduce one of the world's leading experts, Dan Kayan, research meteorologist with the Scripps Institution of Oceanography at the University of California, San Diego. He's also a researcher with the U.S. Geological Also, uh, the great in, in, in. So, uh, Sink or Swim is really a remarkable collection of photographs uh, globally that document how people, cities are adapting to uh, the sea level rise, coastal storms, and the like from a variety of low and, and high tech solutions. Uh, this planning and adaptation is going to be increasingly important. Uh, the planet is, is warming. Uh, really, there's no turning back. We're, we're uh, loading the, the atmosphere with greenhouse gases, and, and we're, we're embarking on a really towards a new climate future. Uh, sea level has been rising uh, historically. It's uh, in the last uh, couple of decades, it's risen at a greater rate. And uh, we, we think very confidently that it will accelerate in the next several decades. Um, once these rates increase, it's hard to reverse because there is so much inertia in the system. And, uh, the greenhouse gases that are that are loading the atmosphere are a long-term presence. Uh, it's important to know that uh, the scientific community's estimates of sea level rise have increased over the last decade, uh, and and that is evidencing the uh, magnitude of this problem. But um, on the other hand, if 
uh, we have coastal storms uh, and, and cyclones and the like, which are going to cause a lot of our, our intense problems. Even if those do not increase, the fact that average sea levels are increasing and these storms are riding on top of them, uh, they are going to intensify the problems. Recent examples, of course, Katrina, uh, the Superstorm Sandy episode, uh, remind us how devastating uh, these impacts uh, can be. The, um, as I noted, in the last couple of decades, uh, sea level has uh, increased at a greater rate, increased by about a time and a half globally. Um, it it uh, doesn't seem like uh, a, an enormous amount because these are measured in millimeters per year, but it's, a, it's cumulative. And as the climate warms, uh, the potential for unleashing uh, stored water on Earth, uh, largely in Greenland, Antarctica, uh, holds a lot of potential sea level rise in the future. Sea level rise will not end in 2100. It's, it's, a, it's an ongoing uh, problem as the, the planet adjusts to a, a new, uh, essentially a new energy balance because of, of greenhouse gases. Mainstream es estimates today put uh, sea level rise at the end of the century approaching three feet above present levels. That's going to be uh, tremendously challenging to low-lying areas. Globally, we can think of uh, areas such as Bangladesh, uh, island nations, and in the United States, areas such as Florida, the United States, and some of our own coastal areas here in, in California have particular vulnerabilities. Uh, along this coast, of course, we've had examples in the last uh, couple of decades. The great El Nino years of 1982 and 83 took out a lot of the vulnerable structures along the coast, 90, 97, 98, another uh, really intense year. We have a developing El Nino that bears watching. So uh, what I would say is that uh, we, have, we have looming challenges that are growing. We, we can see them coming. Science, of course, is really uh, imperative to inform us, but these kinds of uh, devices such as the Annenberg exhibit, uh, the Aquarium of the Pacific, and uh, really the, the city of Long Beach and its efforts to build a resilient uh, city is, is just imperative. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Jerry. Thank you, Dan. Yep. Now, Patrick West, city manager for the city of Long Beach, is going to talk about what Long Beach is doing to prepare for rising seas. Pat. Thank you, Jerry. Um, while many of us go through life, our positions is kind of a dime a dozen. Um, Dr. Schubel does not. This guy is priceless, and we value what he's done for us in the city of Long Beach. When I talk about subjects like today, <clears throat> I'll talk, I'll say, well, I'm not a scientist, Dr. Schubel is, and we're happy to follow his leadership and his direction. So Long Beach Mayor Robert Garcia and our entire city council are committed to making Long Beach a model of a climate resilient city. To help achieve the goal, the mayor has asked the Aquarium of the Pacific to take a lead role in identifying those aspects of climate change to which Long Beach is most vulnerable assessing the extent of the vulnerabilities, evaluating, evaluating ways of mitigating and adapting to them. Based upon this analysis, the city will translate the findings into specific strategies and incorporate them into our climate action plan. The mayor has asked the aquarium to brief the city council on its progress sometime this summer and to complete their analysis by the end of the capital year, the calendar year. Sea level rise is a threat to all coastal areas, and Long Beach is no exception. Some areas of Long Beach are more vulnerable than others. The peninsula and, Al and Alamitas Bay areas are most vulnerable and already face serious challenges of flooding from coastal storms. This vulnerability will only increase in the future as sea level continues to rise. 
even if the frequency and intensity of coastal storms remain the same, they will be superimposed upon a higher standing area. Many scientists believe that with continued climate change, coastal storms will increase in frequency and intensity. This afternoon, the aquarium has convened a meeting that will bring together coastal scientists from the Scripps Institute of Oceanography, the USC Sea Grant, the Port of Long Beach, and the US Geological Survey to continue their exploration of these issues. The city and residents of our peninsula area will be involved in this meeting. Their goal is to map out all the post, the past, and ongoing efforts and to identify critical areas where additional research is needed. We will be looking at both a relatively short-term horizon for the year 2025 and a longer-term horizon of 2050. Going beyond this probably makes little sense because the uncertainty of sea level rise projections gets greater the farther into the future one goes. The city will build upon the port's efforts, which are restricted to the boundaries of the Long Beach port. This entire project is very collaborative and involves some of the best minds in the state on different aspects of climate change and how to adapt. Other areas that are going to be examined include how the increases in the number of days when temperatures exceed 95 degrees, and of course, the drought. Our partners include the Long Beach Water Department, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration's National Weather Service, and many, many others. The City of Long Beach leadership and staff have made climate resiliency and readiness for rising sea levels a top priority for our community. I am proud to be a part of that process to keep Long Beach on the forefront of these issues. And with that, I'd like to thank you and congratulate um, Dr. Schubel. Thank you, Pat. Thank you, Pat. We have a wonderful partnership with the city. And before I introduce our next speaker, I want to come back to a point that Dan made. He used the word looming. If those of you can remember when you read Moby Dick, looming, loomings were used frequently in that book. Loomings were indistinct images on the horizon. The closer, you couldn't tell if it was a whale or not. They were indistinct images. And sea level rise is a little bit like that. We know what's happening. We know it's going to happen for a long time. The rate at which it will happen is what we don't know very well. There could be big surprises. And so the three feet at, in 2100 could be much, much more than that. And as we get more scientific data and more, do more research, th those estimates will become much more accurate. Now I want to introduce Francis Anderton. Francis is the guest curator of Sink or Swim for the Annenberg Space for Photography, and she is the host of KCRW's DNA, Design and Architecture Program. Please join me, me up here, Francis. Thank you very much. Oops. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Schubel. It's really, I think I speak on behalf of um, my team that I work with at the Annenberg Space for Photography in saying how grateful we are that you chose to bring the show here. It's incredibly exciting. I don't think any of us ever would have imagined that the show would wind up here, particularly as the show did not actually start, I have to tell you, being about sea level rise. The show actually started being about architecture. That's why I was brought in by Patricia Lanza, who's the creator of talent and content at the Annenberg Space for Photography. She is here too. You should all speak to her afterwards. But anyway, Wallace Annenberg was originally interested in an exhibit that would look at um, humanitarian architecture. She was very interested in work she'd seen over the last 10 or 15 years that had responded that, uh, with very organic and often very environmentally sensitive responses to disasters and she was interested in us exploring that in the form of a photography exhibit. Well the further we got into our exploration of this the more we learned that so many of these disasters and we're talking here the Asian tsunami, the um, tsunami in Japan, the floods in the Philippines, the um, Sandy, Katrina, there was, there was obviously a connective theme. These disasters were taking place on the coastlines where they were subject or, or, or commu large communities of people were subject to intense storm surges or intense storms that are predicted, as we have just heard, to be increasing in the future. So this was clearly a problem that we had to become very aware of and it was clearly an issue that, that absolutely had an architectural 
um, dimension to it. So anyway, our, that's, that's, the, that's the road our show went on. It became Sink or Swim. It became a show that brought together issues of adaptation, resilience, and often very inspired thinking, and brought those together with, with science. Um, what Sink or Swim, we hope, does is dramatize through photography a story that, frankly, is quite difficult to access in terms of through data and, um, and uh, the, the very precise scientific data. So we have a brilliant um, panel of photographers, Ewan Barn, Stephen Wilkes, uh, Paula Bronstein, Monica Nuenz, um, I'm m missing one of my photographers here, um, but uh, marvelous photographers who you'll see outside who have, who have caught this story as expressed through the human experience. And by the human experience, we look at two dimensions of it. We look at the human impact of these disastrous uh, weather and sea events, but we also and primarily look at the human capacity to respond in situations that are highly devastated, that can take the form of adaptation, it can take the form of imaginative and inspired retreat, which I think you might know is quite sort of politically difficult. Um, but, um, but anyway, and as the previous speakers have mentioned, we show responses that go from the almost the handmade in Bangladesh. You'll find the pictures of Jonas Ben Dixon, who, caught, who, who has followed a community over the years, hundreds if not thousands of people who've been rend rendered landless, and a young architect who did his training away from Bangladesh and went back to his country, went back to his community to work with them and, and turning their basic flat bottom boats into, into floating schools, floating libraries, floating health centers, using the most basic of solar technologies to adapt to a very bad situation. Um, on the other hand, at the other extreme, we have the Netherlands, uh, pho photographs by Iwan Barn. He's a really incredibly well-respected architectural photographer. He also captured a very famous photograph now of New York following Sandy, split into two halves, dark and light, when the power went out. But he shows some of the really super sophisticated planning that you find in a country like Netherlands that's been dealing with this issue for literally a millennia. But now is also, it doesn't stay still, it is thinking still, it is thinking again about how best we should adapt to our circumstances. Is the best way to respond to rising seas to put up massive seawalls? Or are there more, what, what are called softer ways of, of, of creating resilience to bad, um, to, 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 to the threat of rising waters? So these are all issues that we try and explore in ways that are dramatic and emotionally powerful and that I hope you'll take a chance to explore. And last of all, what I should say is the thing that really did emerge the more we studied this was that we have the issue of rising seas, but that is coupled with our desire to live on coastlines. There is an intense level of development on coastlines um, just in our own backyard. When I was researching the, sh the, the project and I talked to Tom Ford with the Bay Foundation in, in Santa Monica, and he said, in the Santa Monica Bay, it's pretty simple what happened to our coastline over the past 100 years. We've had four million people move into the neighborhood. Well, when four million people move into a fragile terrain like the, um, I want to call it the PCH, I mean, as if God gave us the PCH, but um, <laughs> um, the, 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 our, our, our California coastline, we have some issues that we have to consider. So, so I think what I, would, I will leave you with, let's take on board the sea level rise science as well as our human desire, need to build on coastlines and let's find a way to build that is sensible and practical and resilient for the future while um, while defending against our challenges, but also acknowledging the forces of nature. So I hope that those lessons, uh, I hope that those 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 um, thoughts come through in the pictures that you'll look at today. Thank you very much. Thank you, Francis. It's clear that architecture and design are going to play big roles in determining our future living along the coast. And I think that the real challenge is to design the coast that human beings want for the future. 
That's what we have to do. Sea level has been rising for 18,000 years. It rose rapidly at first and it flattened out. And for the last 7,000 years or so, it was pretty flat. And it was during that period, people moved to the coast. That's when most of the cities were, major cities were developed, the coastal infrastructure. A and um, now 50% of the population globally and 70% in California live near the coast. And now the sea is beginning to rise and it's coming to greet us. So we had this massive migration to the coast, one of the two largest migrations in the history of humankind. The other one was the migration into cities, many of which are on the coast. And now sea level is rising and coming to meet us. So we have this amazing coastal squeeze that we have to figure out how to live with. And as you've heard from uh, Dan, this isn't something that's going to go away in 10 years or more. We're, we're committed to a rising sea for a long, long period of time. We don't have to panic in most places, but we do have to start to plan and figure out how we're going to live with the riser, rising sea. And so that's the, the programs that we've put together include this amazing photographic exhibition that gives you a look at how people have decided to adapt to sea level rise around the world. We have an experience on the sphere behind me that we're going to show you in a minute. And we also have a, a mini-series of, of lectures that we think will give a, a great tutorial for people on the scientific and human aspects of sea level rise and what it means. And Dan will be giving one of those talks. We start on, on the 24th of, of June. Another one will be given by a colleague of his from Scripps, Reinhard Flick. And then sandwiched between the two, there is, is one by John Gillis, who wrote a book called The Human Shore, and I believe you quoted that in, in the, uh, the exhibit at, uh, the, at Sink or Swim. The Sink or Swim will be here at the aquarium through September the 15th, and we hope that lots and lots of people will come and enjoy it and learn from it. Now we, we're gonna answer a few questions that have been submitted by our, our viewers. Um, Claire, do we have any questions? Maybe, all right, let, let, maybe we get our, all of our experts, Francis, Dan, Pat, all come on up here. And um, the first one is for Francis. What image is your favorite? What, what image is your favorite and why does it resonate? Now we'll have to repeat the question because people are watching remotely. Oh my goodness. <laughs> Can I give two? Um, let's see. Well, I do love a picture by Stephen Wilkes of a man called Sedgie Connolly, who is standing on the porch of his newly built house um, that is part of the Make It Right project in New Orleans. It was designed by an architect called Tom Main, and Tom Main was brought into the Make It Right project that I'm sure you're all familiar with, went into the Lower Ninth Ward after Katrina. There was debate about whether this particular neighborhood should actually just be left to the basically whether they should retreat um, and not build at all because it was so low-lying. They went ahead, rebuilt houses, and um, and Stephen Wilkes just captured this um, resident, Sedgy Con Connolly, at six in the morning looking so debonair, standing on the porch of this house that he may himself not have been aware of all the technology that went into the thinking, but Tom Main saw this house as a prototype for a house that would rise in floods. And so you had one man's architectural ambition meeting another man's pride in his home, beautifully captured by Stephen Wilkes. So that's one of my favorites. <laughs> Can I have a favorite? It's also yeah. by Stephen Wilkes. It's not here, but Patricia is going to try to help get it for us. It's the roller coaster yes. in New Jersey that's uh, submerged in, in water. Yes, and yes. And it's an amazing, daughter. amazing photograph that sends a powerful, powerful signal. Claire, what's the next question? Uh, my question is for Melanie. Is there a lesson in California that is particularly memorable? Okay. Are there places in Long Beach and the rest of Southern California that are particularly vulnerable? And what would the costs of protection be? Maybe I think this should be both of you guys. Who wants to start? <laughs> Thank you. I'll, I'll start with Long Beach. Um, certainly, we'd have to call the Port of Long Beach. The Port of Long Beach. Um, will probably be the, 
the largest port in America soon. It'll overtake LA very shortly. They're expanding approximately $3 billion in infrastructure improvements right now. One includes the Gerald Desmond Bridge. Um, we'll soon be one of the largest zero emission um, ports in the world. But that's something that we're incredibly interested in. In addition to that, we have approximately nine miles of coastline. And with that, we have many residential properties on those coastlines, recreational opportunities as well. We have two marinas, <coughs> the Rainbow Lagoon Marina and Alameda Bay, which you've just remodeled. Um, it spent, invested probably $100 million in those two marinas. In addition to that, um, we have our peninsula area that Dr. Schubel talked about earlier, and I did as well, that's very um, vulnerable for storms and things right now. So definitely, um, those are the areas in Long Beach that we pay particular attention to. We work with the California Coastal Commission and our coastal development permit. Whenever we do any new building, we talk about um, sea level rise and what the footings and the foundations of those buildings should be. Now to Dr. Dan. Thanks. Um, well, uh, so Long Beach is probably emblematic of the open coast here in California, and there's a number of areas that historically have um, itinerantly flooded, and, and those, those areas, of course, are going to be concerns. One of the other areas in the state that is uh, of paramount importance is the Bay Delta region. Of course, that's our largest estuary. Uh, it's uh, in, in the upper reaches, it's the area that we draw a lot of the high quality water um, that comes south in the state. And that area is, um, is protected by a, a series of levees, some of them somewhat aging and uh, probably um, under not the best engineered uh, conditions as they were built. Um, scores of years ago. Uh, sea level rise uh, combined with heavy freshwater flows that come off from the Sierras, uh, which is another problem in that um, we are facing uh, a big change in our hydrology in the state as snow changes to rain and all of a sudden we're, we're uh, enjoying more runoff than, than traditionally we've had. And that comes to kind of a head in, in the delta, in the confluence of the Sacramento and San Joaquin rivers there. Um, that area also is, is subsiding. It's built on peat soils. And uh, as sea levels are rising, the land is, is in some places sinking. So we, we there have uh, a number of challenges that uh, have to be confronted. And uh, it's, it's both an engineering and, and really a social uh, challenge that we have in deciding how we're going to proceed. And of course, that's being worked on. But um, that, that, I think, is one of the most acute uh, problems we have. And I would, would remind people that here in Southern California, we get about 70% of all of our fresh water from the Delta region. And uh, as Dan points out, those levees are to uh, almost all just earthen levees. They're very vulnerable. And if, if they were to be breached by storms superimposed upon a higher sea, we could lose 70% of our fresh water, and it would take a long time to get that back. Another one. What can the public do to, to help and prepare? Who would like to start with that? Mr. <laughs> Mr. <laughs> <laughs> public <laughs> official? <laughs> <What the>? Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> um, the public can do what you're doing this afternoon, getting involved in the city's climate action plan. I think that's probably the most important thing that you can do. Pay attention to this um, issue. Pay attention to what the Aquarium of the Pacific's doing in hosting a series of speakers and topics. But again, the city's commi committed to this. We're doing a climate action plan. And I think that's something um, the local citizens should pay a lot of attention to, get involved with, and that's where your voice will be heard. And Dan, add to that, please. Uh, education is, is, of course, critical to make good decisions. And uh, we, we have emerging science. Uh, as Jerry mentioned, there's a lot of uncertainty, but um, it's, uh, it's, it's very likely the planet is warming. Seas are rising. It's a matter of, of um, really when 
and how fast, not if. Uh, the, the other thing I would underscore is uh, that um, in today's world of instant gratification and rapid communications and exchanges, we also have to take a longer view. Uh, it, we have these, these uh, cascading problems that are developing and they're generational problems. Uh, so that uh, we're not going to solve these instantaneously. Um, this is a cultural uh, sort of development that we have to encourage, much as uh, the Netherlands has done. They've traditionally fought this battle. Uh, and that's, that's the kind of thing that we, we have to do today. There's a multitude of uh, actions that people can take, uh, beginning at home and uh, also uh, involving our, our elected officials and institutions get involved. I think that's what Pat mentioned, and I think that's, that's really critical. Let me add a note, and then Francis, I'd like you to add something. I would say taking the longer view, and also, I think we live in, a, in an age when many ideas are considered to be dangerous, and, and uh, the strategy is kill, kill them as quickly as possible. If ever there were a time when we need to keep all options on the table, keep ideas alive, keep, keep banging them up around and see what, what merits they have, that's the only way we're going to solve these problems, whether it's the drought or climate change, because as was mentioned, these are, these are wicked problems. You can't solve them. There's no silver bullet. If you formulate them properly, you can manage them to keep them within bounds. And that means you can't take options off the table. And Francis, you have a very powerful voice uh, with your program and the, the exhibit that you created. What role do you see the public playing? That's, that's, a, that's a very interesting question because we actually debate this quite a lot because, as you know, climate change, um, on the one hand, it's the most pressing issue of our time, and on the other hand, it's one that the media grapples with because they know it's a bit of a downer, you know, as a topic. So how do you tell that story where you make people feel engaged? I will say, in, in regard to Sink or Swim, the show, one of the... Um, one of the most edifying kind of reactions that we got was a lot of people came away saying they felt inspired. And um, to be inspired in the face of an issue that, that many people feel is too big to even get their arms around, I felt was, was really, we were really, really thrilled by that reaction. So to that end, I would say um, we humans have a tremendous capacity to adapt. We have a tremendous capacity also to build ourselves into problems that we can also build ourselves out of. And so I hope that the message that comes through in this show conveys or gets us thinking about which route is the best route to go. But to your point about being in journalism, Yes, it's an, it's, we do have that platform on which, through which we can educate. I do think, as you know, everybody in this room knows, the issue of climate change becomes highly polarized and, and becomes a political football. So we're constantly at KCRW uh, talking about sort of how do we tell that story um, or rather do we sort of keep reiterating those political arguments with my design show I have that freedom to talk about inventive solutions, um, the, the capacity to adapt. So I think that's very important. Can I just say one last thing to what Dan said? Dan, you, you talked about how um, we've got to think long term. We live in this world where we're so interconnected with all our social media that we're doing everything in the fastest second. However, the, the other side of that coin, and I hope too that that comes through this show, is how much as a world we're interconnected. It is no longer possible to say, that, oh, the Philippines had that dreadful storm, the poor uh, people of Philippines. Now we understand, and, you know, but it's them, it's not us. We've got this, you know, we've built in a whole different way, blah, blah, blah. What we, we're interconnected. I think that's something we all have to understand. I hope the show conveys it. And obviously your work does all the time. Thank you, Francis. And while, I, while sea level rise has been this slow, inexorable rise of sea level, um, and it will lead to inundation, and we could have some surprises depending upon what happens to the Antarctic and Greenland, 
Right now, today, we have problems of flooding. We have them here in Long Beach of the peninsula, as Pat West pointed out. We've got Katrina, we, we've got Superstorm Sandy, and El, if, when we've had El Ninos in the past. So I think while we're dealing with the longer term issue of climate change, we can make some headway uh, by focusing on some of these intense uh, weather-related events. We have another one. That's it. Anybody here sitting out in front of us have a question you would like to direct to anyone but me? Some <laughs> anybody have a question you'd like to ask anybody? No? Okay, well, we thank you for coming, and now we're going to show Rising Sea. Uh, this was one of the original programs that the aquarium created for Science on a Sphere. Uh, we've created, I think, now 11 or 12 of these programs. There are 110 of these facilities around the world, and part of the deal that you make when you get one of these facilities is that any program that you develop will be made available to all of the other institutions at no cost. And we are extraordinarily fortunate to have a very talented group of filmmakers here, and w they have made more of these stories than any other institution out of the 110. And so this was one of the very first, I think it lasts about four minutes and 30 seconds. So let's, let's play that, please, Derek. <laughs> In the blackness of space, there is an oasis of life. Planet Earth, our home. A place of endless adaptation to an ever-changing world. Every second of every day, satellites stream massive amounts of data about our planet. We get more information in one hour than we did in one year just a decade ago. Scientists analyzing the data conclude sea level is rising, and it's rising faster than ever before in modern history. Sea level is rising because the Earth is getting warmer. It rises for two reasons. First, like all fluids, water expands when it is heated. And second, a warming Earth melts mountain glaciers and continental ice shelves. The combination is a one-two punch for coastal communities, both natural and man-made. Because of sea level rise, violent storms like hurricanes and cyclones will become even more destructive. By the end of this century, storm waves could be 40% higher, causing massive erosion, destroying coastal homes, businesses, and infrastructure. Islands and coastlines all over the world are threatened. Until a few hundred years ago, plants, animals, and people in many coastal areas found new places to live when the water got too high. Today, things are not so simple. Many of the largest cities in the world are built along coasts. More than half the people on Earth live near the ocean. Vast sums of money have been spent on coastal infrastructure. Seaports, airports, power plants, treatment plants, bridges, highways, railroads, all are at risk. California must prepare for increased flooding and erosion. By 2100, we could face sea level rise of five feet or even more. In Southern California, Alec Lors is sounding the alarm by putting up measuring sticks all along the coastline in Ventura. We're gonna be affected by sea level rise right here where we're standing. And it's not just some abstract scientific thing that'll happen way in the future, but it's happening now and it's happening to our community. San Francisco, one of our most vulnerable and beloved American cities could face catastrophic flooding. One visionary proposal is to build a new system of levees called folding water that could protect parts of the Bay Area estuary. Folding water is a dynamic ventilated levee. Its concept is to maintain the estuary as we know it. Barriers are a partial solution, but they won't work everywhere. For some communities, relocation is the only choice. In Alaska, the entire village of Shishmaref is planning to move inland. That's why they have to move our houses. If, if they never moved these houses, they would be in the water already, and we would be homeless. 
Around the world, coastal cultures thousands of years old could soon be lost beneath the sea. The Maldives is a nation of islands. If sea level rises five feet, most of the country will be underwater. To drive that point home, that's exactly where the cabinet held a meeting. This is a challenging situation. And we want to see that everyone else is also occupied as much as we are and would like to see that people actually do something about it. Around the world, regions shaped by river deltas are especially at risk. Bangladesh is on the front lines. By the next century, 26 million of her people could be displaced. Some protection could come from natural barriers, like salt marshes and mangroves. Throughout Southeast Asia, villagers are replanting mangroves as the first line of defense. We are all doing this to save the Sundarbans. We do participate because without forest, we cannot survive. In Europe, low-lying countries face the same dilemma. A full third of the Netherlands is below sea level. For hundreds of years, the Dutch have battled the sea. But the old solutions are no match for today's challenges. We have learned, uh, in the end, not only uh, fighting against the water, but also living with the water. Looking beyond houseboats, some Dutch visionaries imagine entire floating neighborhoods, even floating skyscrapers. The evidence is overwhelming. Sea level is rising. The future demands that we think and act differently. To cope with the changes will require creativity, innovation, flexibility, optimism, commitment. We have choices. We can block the rising sea or channel it, stay put or move inland. One choice is critical. We must reduce our dependence on coal, oil, and natural gas. We must adapt to the challenges of the rising sea.